Wondering how your mindset affects your life? How to bring more energy into your business and life? Millions of people around the world ask these same questions daily. You are in the right place. Learn practices that will help give your life the meaning and success you've been searching for. Welcome to the Charge Podcast, teaching you how to create habits around real goals every day. Practical life advice from those who made it. Here's your host, Gary Wilbers. Wow. Thanks to you, my new book launched as an Amazon bestseller. Let's keep the momentum going. Cultivate Positive Culture, 10 Actions to Faithful Living is now available for purchase. As a listener to the Charge Podcast, I would love for you to get a copy of the book. You can go where you purchase books, or better yet, go to my site and order the book directly from us. And I will give you free shipping and handling since you are helping us with sharing our message to others. Just go to CultivatePositiveCulture.com to get your copy today. Thanks for supporting the Charge Podcast by purchasing the book directly from us. Remember, all the details about ordering is at chargepodcast.com, where Chris does a great job of sharing all the notes about the upcoming podcast. Check them out. At the end of this podcast, I will share a brief excerpt from the book. Are you frustrated and stressed out with your professional and personal life? The Charge Podcast will help you get recharged. We are in the last two months of 2020. Our guest list in November, we found some interesting people who will share their journey to finding charge each day in business and life. Make sure to listen each week and see how you can apply the lessons they share with the chargers in your own life. The goal of the Charge Podcast is to help you realize what is most important to your life. Chargers are committed to finding how each day they can make their life better by the willingness to learn, grow, and become the person they were meant to be. I think this quote I coined in my new book, Cultivate Positive Culture, your purpose defines you, guides you, and allows you to become the person God created you to be. You made a great choice in listening to this podcast. Remember, the podcast is named Charge after my mantra, create habits around real goals every day. Let's get recharged in this podcast to influence a positive culture in your life each day. Welcome, Chargers. We're glad to have you back for another great podcast. I love bringing different people each week to bring you different perspectives so you can decide what works for you and your business. Really, it's about creating that positive culture in business and life. And today, our guest is Dr. James Richardson. He's the founder of Premium Growth Solutions, a strategic planning consultancy for early stage consumer packaged goods brands. He has helped more than 75 CPG brands, we'll do the short version there, including those owned by Coca-Cola, Venturing, as well as emerging brands such as Mother Kambuka. He has also hosted his own podcast, Startup Confidential, and his thoughts appear regularly in industry publications such as Food Navigator. James is also the author of Ramping Your Brand, a number one best-selling book for business consulting on Amazon. Dr. Richardson, is great to have you on the Charge Podcast. Welcome. Thank you very much, Gary. Great to be here. Well, it is great to have you here. I always start every guest with the same question. I have a mantra, charge. Create habits around real goals every day. What habit or habits has led to success in your life? I attack the first draft of whatever I'm working on mercilessly, Gary. Yeah. So <laughs> that, that has built a daily habit of productive self-criticism. <laughs> That's right. It allows you to get started, though, at least, and move forward. And I'm glad you shared that. I shared your bio, Dr. Richardson, but would you share kind of your story, how you got to this point of being an author and kind of a thought leader in your area? Sure. Yeah, I, uh, I began, I went straight out of college into academia. So I was thinking I was going to be a, a professor of anthropology. That was the goal. That was the point. Um, and that's what a lot of good introverts do. <laughs> um, so here I am, uh, 25 years later, doing what no introvert in their right mind wants to be doing. <laughs> right. So, be on a podcast and share the message. So I'd rather hide in a closet, right? So, um, <laughs> so 
there's a couple steps of transition that happened. The one was that I, I realized that uh, I wasn't cut out to enjoy working in my field, which is a painful thing to learn 10 years in. So I, you know, one day, Gary, I'm going to write a book. It has nothing to do with what I do now, but I, the book that's really going to sell. <laughs> and I already have the title, and, and it's because it comes straight out of my existence. <laughs> and it, it, I've done it twice. And the first time I did it was when I walked out of academia and I wasn't kicked out. I, I, I wasn't fired. In fact, I was doing relatively well in the brutal reality of trying to get tenure. But I, I left the field. I just walked away. And that's going to be the title of my book, Walking Away, Why, why It's the Best Thing You May Ever Do in Your Life. And it, it's kind of a, um, it sounds like a negative thing to say, but, and, and obviously it was painful to go through when you leave a career that you were thinking about for 15 years straight. It's not fun, but it was extremely cathartic and it needed to happen. Uh, and it set me down a path of personal growth that I didn't really see coming, but it never would have happened. I think if I hadn't left academia, because academia had been, and a lot of people I think who are like me, uh, just personality wise, when they're young, they get into this, they, they find a rut in which they don't challenge themselves. <laughs> so, the guy who gets, you know, A plus in school becomes the professor because it's almost cliche, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and he doesn't have to challenge himself. So academia is a great place to grow, go if you don't want to in incur, incur personal growth. I, I don't have anything against people in academia, but it's not going to be the place that causes that to happen. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> it's a place you can go and hide and not grow, and maybe you'll be productive. So I was really, looking back on it, I, I'm so thankful that I talked myself out of it. Um, but then I went into market research, Gary, which was a good place for an academic to land. Um, but it wasn't a great place for me to stay because I, I, um, uh, I have big ideas and I don't, I don't do well in authority uh, with authority figures hanging over me. If you, I don't know if you ever worked with a market research firm. It's super, they're always very command and control and very, you know, everything's to the ninth decimal. And it, yeah, it's just not, that's not how I function. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had to get out of that too. So I had to quit again, Gary. <laughs> Twice I fired, uh, and that one, that time I actually fired myself from the company because they couldn't bring themselves, they felt so bad about it. <laughs> so, but I, you know, I, I learned that there were skills I learned in academia that were going to apply to the business. Well, it took me about five to seven years to figure that out. And I think I encourage people who have to make a big skill set change like that, that they have to, uh, they really do need to spend some cocktail time or whatever it is for them, uh, non-alcoholic cocktail time, whatever it is, figuring out what are the strengths that led them to that original career that they can carry over and apply because you'll be most happy when you do that. And for me, that meant I had to go out on my own and work with company uh, CEOs and founders directly because those were the conversations that excited me in business when I was a consultant. Um, the most, those are the most engaging, most interesting, most analytically challenging. And so that, that's what led me to do what I do now. I, I worked in a firm that was very much a specialist in emerging natural organic brands. And so that's why you see a book that I wrote, which is all about how do you scale those kinds of businesses? Because that accidentally became my expertise. Um, and, and I would say it became the expertise, Gary, because I opened my, I opened myself up to the topic of business. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you know anything about social scientists, but we skew a little towards the left wing side. <laughs> so making the corporate transition is especially challenging. Sure. I mean, it wasn't that I was anti-business, not in any way, but it wasn't a passion of mine. So getting passionate about it meant I had to be passionate about my clients, or in this case, my founder's business challenges, which are really fascinating in the early stage world because the, the likelihood of surviving is so low, Gary. So I mean, it's, I, I can't think of anything more akin to boot camp than launching a CPG company, which, and they all lose money, Gary, for the first five years, every single one of them. Yeah. Like, can you imagine that five years of running a money losing business? Yeah. I don't run a money. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so it's, it's a terrifying place. And I think 
it's fascinating to come in, you know, not living that terror and helping people think through their challenges um, and find a way to grow that's going to make their business shine without getting caught up in their emotional reality, which is not productive. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the thing that's so interesting about your story is how you found that overlap. Yeah. You know, they always tell on the Venn diagram or whichever <laughs> way you want to look at it, what's that part where the circles interconnect? And yeah. really, a lot of our audience is the same way. So we may be talking about consumer products, but we're talking yeah. about branding and we're talking about individuals. How are we willing to change in yeah. what you've seen for yourself? You've had to kind of reinvent yourself and decide okay, academics, not where I want to be. Um, then the next stage, where do I want to change? And then you kind of find that sweet spots there. And yeah. I think that's, you know, now you've taken your expertise. And like you said, you've developed where you've created basically a brand for yourself. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, because I know you're in the consumer brand, um, products brand side of it. And I think this applies to other brands. So I want people to be open that they hear the message that, yes, we may be talking to consumer brands, but how are you willing to change it? What are some of the primary problems that you see with a new consumer um, as a new consumer brand kind of get started or as they get started if they go grow too quickly? So I... Um... What I see is that I think because entrepreneurial life in the consumer brand world, because it involves manufacturing, people get sucked into operations. It's very complicated operations and logistical challenges of literally getting a third party product produced, sent to stores. And that can, it literally can exhaust them. And there becomes this tunnel vision that can emerge. And this is actually not uncommon with any entrepreneur, whether they're even yep. if in, a, in a B2B business, right? You have the original moment of vision, the wine, the wine and cheese moment in your backyard when you conceived of it, of the, of the thing. And, and then there's a couple more days of honeymoon. Yeah. <laughs> and then and you then, get started. And then you have to get started and you start encountering the first roadblocks, right? And then my, the problem is my clients get sucked into a super complex maze of logistics so fast and it's overwhelming that they, they actually forget uh, to build relationships with their early consumers and actually listen. So I, uh, this may sound surprising to folks who are not in the consumer products industry. And by the way, we're talking about groceries, personal care. I mean, this is, it's all over your house, folks. It's not like you're not involved. <laughs> so, yeah, like, right. You, so you're, you're, you're very much involved. <laughs> so, you're very much involved. So the, um, the, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. The, what were we talking about? The Just really kind of with the growth of that brand where they get oh, that's right. in their tunnel vision. Their tunnel vision that emerges is a logistical and operational one for most of my clients. And so they lose touch with the consumer or they don't reach out or they don't develop the relationship. And then, you know, a year in, they start to get some data back about how the business is performing. And unlike a B2B, that data is slow to arrive on your doorstep in consumer packaged goods because the retailer controls the data and they don't just send it to you. <laughs> right. I won't go into that whole process. But it, like there's a data gap, right? That a B2B business doesn't necessarily have. I mean, you can pretty, you can wake up within a week, you know, where they have lead flow as a lawyer, you know, <laughs> it's right. just like, and then after two weeks, it's super painful. <laughs> but, um, you know, in consumer goods, you'll ship the product. And, you know, if it's a product that only sells once a week and anyways, I mean, it's going to be months before you figure out how you're doing because you pre-sold it. Yeah. And it'll be months before you find out that, hey, the retailer doesn't want another case. Oops. <laughs> right. But I found people get so caught up in the operations that they're not building the consumer uh, interaction and engagement, which does two things. And this is true for B2B. For one thing, it keeps you motivated, right? Because if you have happy consumers, that builds your morale. And everybody needs that. Um, but also, if you've got a dud, Gary... It's sort of qualitative social science 101. Uh, here's a free research list. <laughs> if like 80 to 90% of your sort of randomized feedback is negative, you have a problem with what you're selling. 
<laughs> you, you don't need to go do a survey. <laughs> Eight out of 10 thumbs down is a problem. And you might think, oh, come on, how, how, how much bad product could there be? A lot. So, so people don't, people fire out too fast and they make assumptions that their product is done. And in consumer products, because there's so much out there, it's so much harder to get people's attention. Sure. And, and no, unlike finding an attorney, they're not going to Google and saying best toothpaste in America. That, that's not how that works. 90% <laughs> so of people are uh, just going to the store. They're going to shop the shelf or they're going to ask a friend if they want a really exotic premium modern toothpaste. And by the way, that's the world I'm in is the fancy stuff, the overpriced stuff. So that's coming from word of mouth. So if you don't create a relationship with your consumers there, they don't feel as passionate about your brand. They're less likely to talk about you. Suddenly you become interchangeable and now you have a problem on your hands. And that problem in my world is called repeat purchase because you can't really scale like a, a grocery brand if you're not getting uh, at least 20% of the people to keep buying it again and again. Um, it's not like selling a mattress where you could, like, <laughs> you could, sell, you could sell like a million mattresses and then disappear to the Caymans. Right. Sure. <laughs> it's just because you've you've made your thirty mil, you've made your four hundred million. You're done. <laughs> you may, you may never sell them another one. But in my world, they gotta sell them again. Now that presumes there's a relationship. So now it actually is there's a parallel between B to B and B to C is that there needs to be a relationship. <laughs> but creating that relationship is really hard. So how do you go about kind of getting that growth? Um, to be able to get people really to take that consumer brand to get that relationship that you're talking about. So one of the things I emphasize with folks is that you can't, you can't get so sucked into operations once you've designed the widget that you're not spending time building an email list, producing content, posting on social media, having some kind of a campaign strategy to interact and go out to your, to your public audience, right? And it will be in various degrees of precision, right? Sometimes it'll be PR, like you'll, you'll try to get yourself written about in a local newspaper so that people know your product's available for sale in town, right? Um, you'll have that founder's story or whatever it is. But all those things have to be going on simultaneously because otherwise you won't have lists, you won't have names, you won't have followers on Instagram that you can go reach out to and get, get feedback, but also continue the process of just reminding them, Gary, that you exist. Because in my world, there are no shortage of options. I mean, even in natural organic food and beverage, there's usually four to five options. So it's just, it's frighteningly competitive. Um, so it really shows that, you know, anymore you can't rely on, and you probably couldn't before, but now you have so many tools that you can't rely on the store or the company to take your brand, just getting shelf space, you know, mm -hmm. and for a long time, it was about the shelf space that you could get because if yep. you had the right shelf space, it moved product. What you're really saying is your brand, you're able to create that brand along with, and then that drives them to the place that they purchase. It, even consumer. if it doesn't drive them, Gary, if you can create a relationship, this is, this is advertising 101. You're just reminding them of the trademark. It's just, a, it's a, it's literally a battle for memorability in its most primal, literally primitive form. Okay. Almost pre, it's almost pre-modern, literally like it's, it's shouting the name again and again at them. And the best way to do that is in a relationship content marketing program, not an arrogant top-down advertising campaign. If you're Lay's potato chips, you can be the top-down megaphone. People will take it because you're an American icon. Yeah. But when you're nobody, you can't act that way. People just think you're obnoxious. So if you can do this relationship marketing, um, small brands, it's perfect for them because people, the only reason they're paying more to go and pick you out deliberately is because they actually do want to have a relationship with you. That's what's funny. That's why I literally bang my head on my wall when I meet founders who aren't killing themselves to be in that conversation. Because how else are you going to be more memorable than Lay's potato chips? They have like a hundred million dollar ad budget. They have 25,000 trucks. I mean, it's just, <laughs> you're not going to win against those techniques. So you've got to have these other ones. And I would say, hey, even if you're an attorney trying to market in your local city, that's how you win in you know, Phoenix, Arizona versus the big New York and LA law firms 
who they don't have to do, they don't have to find the rich guy in Phoenix who needs legal advice. He's already looking at the big firms. The guy who can get benefit out of relationship marketing is the local attorney who's actually a lot smarter and going to offer better customer service. Yeah. You know, I love what you're talking about because <laughs> really it fits everyone that should be listening to the podcast. You know, <laughs> how are you differentiating yourself yeah. in the business? And then how are you bringing that to market? So it doesn't matter if you're a small mom and pop, mm-hmm. how are you getting them to realize that you're the place to come and you know, you're differentiating that side of it. You talk a little bit in your book about weird just doesn't sell. <laughs> so can weird eventually become cool? Uh, yes, it's happened before. Uh, and, and I think the one that people relate to most because they're probably a lot of people listening. I mean, you have well-educated, smart people listening. So my guess is they're already in the midst of this transition, which is they're de-sugaring their food in their house. Right. And this is a, this is, this is a movement in American food culture it happened like it started about 15 years ago. And, um, you know, I was in the trenches doing social science research about what was going on. So I'm a little more educated about when it started than most people, but low sugar and reducing the amount of sugar in our food is, is just building this unbelievable tsunami like momentum. Right now. <laughs> and, and part of it has to do with the baby boomers are now, you know, older and they're looking at their bellies and they're aghast. That's part of it. Um, some of them have chronic diseases they're trying to mitigate as well. So I think, but we also have younger people who are also getting into this very early in life, right? Um, so everybody's into it. Everybody's desugaring their diet. Um, but I can tell you that if you went in the early nineties, like when I was in college, if you went, if you had tried to market like a low sugar or God forbid a sugar free, like branded product line, have fun with that. In fact, I'll give you a counter example. One of the, one of the fastest growing snack products in the 1990s was a, was a brand that no longer exists called Snack Wells. You probably remember it. And it was a big Nabisco brand. They put a lot of ad money in. It, it became almost a half billion dollar brand at its peak. And it was all about low fat food, Gary. But you know what they, pump, you know what they pumped up to sell the low fat Snack Wells? Got to make it taste good. So put yeah. sugar to it. They put like three times as much sugar. Yeah. So, so because that works, right? So dark side of the food industry, right? Is they know how to manipulate the mass sensor orientation of, of us, right? But, but what happened is people started to become awakening, awakening the amount of sugar there's a food as diabetes really started to spike in the baby boom generation. I think that mass awareness caused people to go, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And so there's a brand that started in 2006 that I write about in my book called Siggy's Yogurt. You may have heard of it. Uh, most of you probably haven't tried it yet, but yeah, I bet you've seen it um, because it has a lot of shelf space at, at mainstream supermarkets. And it's also obviously at Whole Foods. But this is a brand, this is a brand of yogurt that I'm not making this up. In 2020 dollars, it retailed for in 2020 dollars, it retailed in 2006 for about 450. It was 275 in 20, 2006 dollars. But that in today's money, that's basically what it would cost if it was launching today for a cup of yogurt. Wow. <laughs> now, luckily he picked Manhattan, Gary. <laughs> so 450 for a cup of yogurt, it doesn't even, no one even bats an eye. But I think <laughs> uh, even today- In the Midwest, we would. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, right. You get a whole tray of play for that. <laughs> so, so it was super obnoxiously priced, right? But he also knew he had to get highly intentional people to buy this because people weren't looking for low sugar food because low sugar, like I said, that was like the kiss of death in marketing. If you tried to market a low sugar yogurt in 2000, even in 2005, that would not have gone over well. Yeah. Because it, but that just says bad taste to the average person, even the average educated person. And so it took a while for people to start to play around with some of these brands. And Siggy's was one that got an un- interesting level of traction in the big cities like LA and New York amongst educated folks who were into fitness, for example, and who are the kind of people who are really looking at their waist every morning. <laughs> In the mirror, you know, there's a whole crowd of people who are staring at it every morning, weighing themselves every morning. Um, and there, those people, by the way, Gary, aren't actually overweight. They're the normal weight people doing. It. You know, that. Yeah. <laughs> so just, you don't get obese because you're neurotic and skin and weigh yourself every day. <laughs> so, 
So they got into this brand because it was like, wow, nine grams of sugar, 13 grams of sugar. And at the time, Gary, yogurt had up to 40 grams of sugar in a Yoplait. It was like drinking a soda. Yeah. But the problem is you had to be, you had to be willing to eat something that actually tastes like real yogurt, Gary. And Americans didn't know what a real yogurt was. I mean, really didn't because we're eating these imitation forms of yogurt with either the fat sucked out or the sugar replaced with a million chemicals. <laughs> um, and so a real natural low sugar yogurt is sour. It's really sour. It's so, sour patch sour. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's not pleasant, right? Doesn't taste good. Right. It's not pleasant if you're used to the other things. So it, took, it takes people like months to get used to seeking. So the only people who stuck with it were the people who'd stare at the scale every morning yeah. who have a lot of money in Manhattan. <laughs> so. so what is consumers now? Are they ready? You know, with the pandemic, of course, it's created a different challenge yeah. for us. But do you think, are they really ready to try new brands um, at it's this time? It's been challenging for my clients. I'll be honest. Trial has, trial has gone down. Um, you know, what's ironic, circling back to what we talked about in the beginning of the episode, guess, guess who's doing better with trial in a distracted, anxiety-ridden environment? It's the people who built a strong relationship with their early consumers. Back that they've, they've got word of mouth still happening. It's still getting introduced <laughs> to people. You know, the people who are just focused on logistics, they're hurting the most because they weren't really doing effective outreach. And, and I'm not talking about like expensive ad campaigns. I'm talking about scrappy stuff that, you know, the one thing about an entrepreneur like myself or even my clients have, we have time. The one thing we can give is time. I mean, it's somewhat limited, but we, we can always give another hour to something. We don't have unlimited cash to go throw at an agency. <laughs> so, so you've got to be willing to give that time. And the pandemic kind of weeds out the people who are, I call them, uh, there's two kinds of remote control entrepreneurs. You've probably met these folks. They're not your guests, but they're the people that hire coaches and stuff sometimes is sort right. of the people. And, and I, I'll be honest, Gary, I avoid them. I screen them out <laughs> because I'm, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not patient enough, godlike enough person. Maybe you are <laughs> to deal with those folks, but they're remote control founders who expect like they expect to be some kind of intermediary thing, like a remote control that they can, you know, use to reduce their work hours, but get the same result. There's a whole cadre of business people like that. Sure. Uh, they tend never to grow and they go out of business. quickly. Then there's other people who they're really who work hard, but they have this really strong work ethic, but they want to focus on operations. And I'll be honest, they tend to be the introverts or the quant and finance guys. Yep. You know, I mean, a lot of MBAs from finance who start food companies and, and I, um, I have a podcast where I kind of make fun of them, uh, you know, because it's like the answer to every question is what's the ROI. And I'm like, if you keep running this business with that attitude, um, you won't make any of those, what I would call secular faith-based decisions, which cause you to spend an extra six hours fine tuning your email campaign or doing PR or just busting that extra time out to build a relationship with your fans so that they remember you exist. Yeah. Cause they don't get, they don't care about your logistical problems in your company. They just don't care. And they never will. <laughs> what they care about is what are you selling me? What's the price? How does it make me feel? And wow, I like that guy. Cause I'm on his email list and he gave me a coupon or whatever. <laughs> so it's just like, Kraft Foods isn't going to give you the personal touch. Right. You know? So. Well, a lot of what you're talking about is, you know, it becomes where to get your brand known is that top of mind awareness. Yep. And I see from the video, cause we're watching video and as we're talking here is your book ramping your brand. And before we have to jump in the recharge round, cause time always goes so fast yes. and you're having a, great conversation share with us just a little bit of what you feel people can get out of your book ramping your brand i know we've talked about it some i think the, some of your philosophies that you're trying to share out there with them but why don't you go ahead and share that um with them dr richardson yeah so at the very generic level you know the book outlines a four-part process to build a consumer brand but let's just back it out of consumer products and you know the book is basically preaching um, something very similar to what Eric Reese wrote about in Lean Startups, you know, which is that don't go out of the gate at a million miles an hour. Uh, think of yourself as an experimenter. 
Think of yourself with a half finished thing, product or service, and go out with your early consumers and finish it. And I'll tell you, Gary, that I actually did that with my own consulting business. I just threw up a lousy website and I just did it to attract initial customers. And then I did the initial work and you know, it wasn't with ideal clients. And, and I needed that because I had to figure out where am I gonna fit in this ecosystem and what, what do these people really want? <laughs> right? And, and can I or can I not help them and how? So I, you budget time there in the early years where you're doing some market research essentially with your early clients. Um, and I write about that in the book. And so then you finish the product and then you're in a better position because you've got this market adapted thing. You know who the audience is, you've proven it, and now you hit the gas, you start investing in resources, you start paying for Google ads if you're a local attorney. Right? <laughs> you know? But you gotta know what's going on and don't assume that you've got it all figured out. That is such a mistake uh, that people continue to make in my industry. Um, what, what, what I find interesting in my industry, Gary, is that they, thousands of people will make that mistake, even though there's like, 200,000 professional consumer packaged goods people working in big companies. Like it's a profession, Gary. <laughs> sure. But I've got like all these thousands of entrepreneurs who don't know any of those people and they're approaching it like, well, maybe my first draft was probably all right. No, <laughs> it was probably not all right. <laughs> so, so if you have that humility, you do an experiment and then you can apply growth techniques from the pros. But it's the assumption that you're done, which I continually run into. And that's the biggest mistake. And I made sure I didn't fall into that too myself. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so easy to do, no matter what type of business that you're in. Yeah. You, you kind of fall into that being everything to everybody and you're <laughs> nobody. Um, yeah. You know, I'll never forget in the late 80s is when I went to college. And, you know, my marketing professor would always say there's three keys, location, location, location. <laughs> Well, if I was doing marketing now, now it's really about relationship, relationship, relationship. Yeah, well, that's because, because, you, that's because they we're oversaturated. Yep, exactly. There's a, mil, there's a million attorneys you can find if you write a lawyer in the web, on the Google search bar. So that's yep. not, the problem is not finding an attorney. It's like, which one do I pick? Yeah, which one fits me? And, and that person that's speaking to you all the time, just like you're talking about in brands, they're going to have the brand awareness and you're going to be buying those products. I mean, think about what's in your shelf now. I mean, yeah. there's a reason you're buying, let's use mouthwash. I buy Scope, okay? I don't buy any other brand. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what. You, so, you know, if they're speaking to me, that's what I come to. So that allows us to really realize um, that yeah. part of it. Just a great conversation because I hope people understand that, you know, we talked about consumer products because that's your niche, but we were talking about marketing is what yes. we were talking about. And how do you get your brand out there and share that into the audience and to the message? Why don't you share with them, Dr. Richardson, how could they reach out to you if they want to check out your book or they want to check out your website? How would they do that? I would encourage people, if they're interested in, in the book, uh, specifically go to rampingyourbrand.com. There's a beautiful little website. Um, and even if it's not your industry, if you know anybody with a consumer product, I would, I would love it. I would be eternally grateful if you forwarded the link to them. Yeah. <laughs> you probably do so, know someone who's in this space <laughs> somewhere in your network. Yeah. And then if nothing else, check it out yourself and just think yeah. about where he's talking consumer products. Think about what yeah. your product is. And I'm sure just like we've been talking today, it's going to overlap in those areas. Well, if you don't mind, I've got six questions I ask every oh, yeah. guest. It's kind of what I call the recharge round. We'll kind of rapid fire through these. But first one is your mindset. How do you believe your mindset affects your daily living? I, I, I think, uh, my mindset is critical to uh, ending the day, not exhausted. So I, I'm, as an introvert, I, <laughs> I kind of pre-organize my day and try to get um, my plan going in the morning. And, and if I don't set it up that way, then I can become a roller coaster. <laughs> to well, don't worry. I'm an extrovert and we can be the same way, you know, both of us, that's everybody that can take a roller coaster. <laughs> so I get very organized in the morning yep. to control my mind, the daily practice. Good. How about the, what do you do daily to bring energy into your life? Uh, man, I fool around with my dog. Yeah. I got to do something non-analytical. <laughs> yep. Yep. 
No thinking, just get to have fun. Good. Yeah. Share the number one connection or relationship that's made the biggest impact on your life. Uh, it's definitely my wife, in, in part because of who she is, but also because I don't have much of a social life. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but she also is the one who, who was critical to getting me further into the consulting world, becoming comfortable with it, because she used to be one. So. Oh, good. good. <laughs> what advice has influenced you the most in your life? Uh, I would say it's advice I got not too long ago from an attorney, (laughs) but I won't say what context, but said attorney, uh, encouraged me to, uh, not let other people run my career. Well, like like your boss, like your boss. (laughs) That's good piece of advice for everyone. Because they will, if you let them. Exactly. <laughs> so are you running the life that you want? Yes. Uh, so that, that I find I smile a lot more during the day. <laughs> How um, about your favorite book and why you love it? My favorite book, which is very, a little nerdy, I, sorry, uh, in advance, is a book called Everybody Lies. And, and it was a New York Times bestseller, but not for very long. And the author is Seth uh, Davidowitz. Um, the book, the book is by a former, former Google database engineer who, mm. who went through, uh, with Google's permission, he actually used a massive and anonymized data set to explore the, um, the unconscious beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors of Americans in about 10 chapters based on looking at what they're entering into the search bar, which they're not talking about on surveys. And they're certainly not admitting in face-to-face interviews with anthropologists like me. So to me, as a social scientist, I'm fascinated by where big data is actually to uncovering buried unconscious beliefs and value systems that we don't talk about. And there's a way to get at that through what I used to do, but it takes forever. Yeah. Take like years in a community to figure it out. Whereas in seconds, you can figure this stuff out with search patterns. Because as he says in the book, you know, everybody lies in the Google. Everybody lies because I've seen their Google search engine. Yeah. <laughs> so. That that sounds very interesting, actually. <laughs> we'll have that in show notes. So go to chargepodcast.com and if you want to check it out because, of, um, you know, think about it. You know, you <laughs> undercover a lot of data there and, you know, in brand and packaging and everything yeah. that's done there to discover. And now, um, so I'm, I'm going to check that one out. Thanks for sharing that. Well, you've almost made it through, but the last one is, what legacy do you want to leave the world in one sentence or less? I would like to publish some books that really make an impact on the general public's critical thinking skills about American society. That, that Before I'm dead, I plan to do that. <laughs> that is a great one. And I think something that we all could learn a lot on, and I don't want to get political, but just the way the world <laughs> is today is one of our challenges we're having is we're not really critical thinking. We're not doing it. We're allowing the media to influence our thinking. And I think that's, uh, you know, like I said, I don't want to get political and stuff, (laughs) but I think that is an overarching theme. We would both agree with that, that if we want to have the critical thinking, critical thinking comes from the person, Mm -hmm. not someone else giving it to you and saying, here's how you need to think. Yeah, I mean, I will admit it's tough, Gary, because we're modern humans in a society like this. We're assaulted with more information per minute than any other any other time in human history. Yes. I mean, the pace of information flow is unprecedented. We weren't really adapted as an animal for this. Yeah. Not at the individual level. Like, I mean, in ancient societies, if there was a new idea that came into town on a horse, there was a whole apparatus that would just shut it down. <laughs> and if necessary beat him up (laughs) but but we don't do that anymore now it's like the screens are in front of you there's no gatekeeper so we have to be critical thinkers yeah there's no one else is going to do it for us well you and i might have to carry that conversation on in another podcast and just talking about critical thinking and our full beliefs and that that side of it because i think it would make it very interesting and getting people to wake up to that side of it 
Dr. Richardson, it's been a lot of fun having you on. I'm so glad you said yes to the Charge podcast. Share with them again how they could get the book or reach out to you if they want to connect with you. They can go to Amazon.com to order the book right now, Ramping Your Brand. And if anyone wants to follow up on the podcast, my email is james at premiumgrowthsolutions.com. Well, Dr. Richardson, great to have you on the Charge podcast. It's been a lot of fun. Chargers, I hope you think about it. Now, how are you thinking about the brands you buy? You know, when you go in that grocery store, <laughs> think about that next time and you'll look at it a little bit differently. Look at the different brands because you probably buy the same one. Now think through the other side of it and do a little bit of research. You may find out you want to really go after a different brand. So Dr. Richardson, thank you again for being on the Charge Podcast. Thank you for having me, Gary. Chargers, I hope you take from this of what do you want your brand to be for your life? It doesn't matter if you have a business or even in your personal life, we all have a brand. What is the brand for yourself? I look forward to coming back next week and sharing another great guest with you. But remember, like and share our podcast. Let others know about it. Our audience keeps growing because you, the listeners, are sharing our message with others. Remember, come back next week and we'll have another great guest. Make it a great day. Here is a short description of the book. Lloyd, a truck driver from Forward Trucking Inc., has a random encounter with death while making his way back home. Lloyd, who is short on faith and options, finds himself in the largest downward spire of his life. He meets an unexpected traveler who sees something in him that Lloyd couldn't find on his own. Together, through a new sense of faith and reason, Lloyd discovers his life's calling. I'm so excited to share this, launch this book with you, and I appreciate your help. To get your copy, go to cultivatepositiveculture.com. Thanks for supporting the book. This podcast has ended, but your life doesn't just stop. To continue your inspiring journey, head over to chargepodcast.com and access all the tools and resources mentioned on today's show. If you enjoyed this episode, consider sharing with somebody who may also benefit from the advice provided. That's chargepodcast.com. Until next time, charge in business and life.